You ready? Okay. Okay. I guess, uh, hello everyone. Um, I guess we'll have, uh, we'll have our delegation come up and speak. Mr. Uh, Doug McCluskey um, from Safety, Safe and Healthy Community Advisory Committee. Welcome. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Councillor Davey and Councillors. I'm Doug McCluskey and I'm representing the 15 members of the Safe and Healthy Community Advisory Committee. As I, as I speak in support of the work plan that's being submitted by staff, on September 5th, the committee resolved that the 2013-14 work plan be approved. Uh, Councillor Scott Davey and Paul Singh have been active participants in our uh, committee meetings. In March, Safe and Healthy began meeting with our new mandate. Much of the discussion is focused on what is the purpose of the Safe and Healthy Community Advisory Committee. In the spring, this was centered on research and understanding the community health model and the City of Kitchener's strategic plan. One of our goals is to review the terms of reference of the committee. This has been an ongoing process. The committee found that by June, we had not managed to meet many of the goals we set out to meet. So as a group, we agreed to meet in July and August. In addition this whole, to these whole committee meetings, four subcommittees have been meeting over the summer months and continue to meet this fall to work to advance the goals of the committee. In May, Safe and Healthy presented the committee's position at a special council meeting regarding the possibility of Kitchener hosting a casino. Our work focuses on matters related to healthy community living together with community safety and crime prevention is needed. The City of Kitchener's strategic plan has led the committee to target quality of life and diversity. Committee members hosted a Jane's Walk in the spring that explored locations in the downtown that work at making sure everyone is included in our community. As we work on the committee terms of reference, we are reaching out to various neighborhood associations, find an email survey, visits neighborhood associations. I'm meeting with the Victoria Hills Neighborhood Association this week. And a plan to be part of the Neighborhood Association Summit in November. Our goal is to see what the neighborhood associations believe is a safe and healthy community and what we could do to help support their vision. A major concern of the committee is how we offer ample opportunities for inclusion. A subcommittee is conducting focus groups such as with the Afghani and Somalian soccer groups, people with disabilities in the core and other unengaged groups in our community. This is ongoing this fall and is providing information that will help guide the development of our terms of reference and provide ideas for recommendations on ways to engage these groups. We do not operate in isolation. A group of safe and healthy members will be meeting with our counterparts from Waterloo and Cambridge in October as we started looking at commonalities and a possible common term of reference for or definition of what safe and healthy communities mean in the region of Waterloo. We're a vibrant, passionate group of individuals who with support of staff such as uh, Mark Hildebrand and Sue Weir um, are working to make a difference in the city of Kitchener. On behalf of Safe and Healthy, thank you for your opportunity to share what the community has been doing and we recommend the acceptance of the uh, work plan report. If there's any questions, Chair. Yes, uh, Councillor Singh. Yes, uh, through you, Mr. Chair and Doug. Really good to see you here yep. and speaking of all the highlights of what the, the committee has been able to achieve just in the last few months alone. Mm -hmm. And that says a lot from where we were just a year ago. Um, and you touched on a few, uh, especially on the quality of life and, of course, the uh, community engagement aspect mm -hmm. of it. And I think for the, uh, the committee here, it would be really helpful to see how that originated, some of that discussion, uh, more to the, uh, the soccer-related uh, mm -hmm. as to engagement of actual groups uh, and also as a neighborhood model of seeking out to the, the asso different associations. Sure. Um, if you can speak on that or touch yeah. on that, what, that'd be great. What is, uh, uh, we forever seem to be coming back at the uh, committee, coming about how do we include those that are unengaged in community associations or things that are going on in the community. So a subcommittee, like since we kept going to it, subcommittee started reaching out. Um, and one of the fellows that's one of our contacts, uh, Abdul Rahmani is an uh, Afghani in background. He works at Conestoga College. And so he started reaching out and he's saying a big thing in quite a lot of these groups is soccer. And many of these groups don't have the funds uh, to 
engage in a lot of the uh, Kitchener Soccer League things. It's because it's, it's costly. So they're sort of isolated by that, and it's such an important part of their community. So they talked with the Afghani group and a Somali group, and in the, we found out from that quite a bit about the Somali uh, community and how important soccer is to them. And one of the things, too, is that they didn't realize that um, they existed, that opportunities possibly to play with each other. So I know that there's some work uh, has been going on through uh, trying to look at a possibility for a Kitchener, City of Kitchener Mini World Cup in the spring to try to bring some of these groups together. Um, the Neighborhood Association piece, we were kept stumbling along with where, what is a safe and healthy community and what, what, do, the, what do people in the community see has that. And we looked at big surveys and stuff, and then we landed on talking to the neighborhood associations uh, because we had to start somewhere. So uh, what, we, what we've done is uh, we've sent out to all the neighborhood associations, their boards, uh, an online survey, a Google Doc thing that they can reply to uh, us. We've got a few replies so far. Some are, resi some are not as computer literate as others, and they, instead of doing it, I'm going to be going to uh, Victoria Hills this week to talk to them. The lady running it wasn't too keen on the computer piece, but was really keen on me coming. So that's what we're doing there. So does that sort of give no, you the flavor? I, there? I could go on forever, but of course, yeah. myself and Scott sit on the committee, so we're yeah. aware of that. But I think for the rest of the committee, it's helpful sure. to hear how the discussion has gone. So that's good. Mm -hmm. it's been a very vibrant, diverse group too. And that's uh, with uh, quite a lot of participation. So it's been a interesting experience. Yes, it has. And, and I'll quickly make a comment as well, just for the Go interest ahead. of time. And I think it uh, speaks to volumes of all that, uh, that has gone on over the last four months of various different discussions and how we uh, or the committee has been able to break into separate subcommittees. And that's where the in-depth discussion is really stemming from. Mm -hmm. And it's giving the committee direction as to which way to lead to really focus on those very aspects of what its mandate is, looking and seeking and providing input to council for matters for safety and health related. And if we've been able to do, or if that committee's been able to do in a short few months, I'm only excited to see what it has in mind for next year. And some of this, the term of reference as it evolves, and I think it'll be able to put a clear uh, plan forward for next year. So congratulations to you, you and the committee and for all the effort that you do on it as well. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there any other questions before I... Councillor Fernandez. Yes, thank you. Nice to meet you and um, thanks for coming in and taking some time to explain what you've been doing. Um, kudos to you guys for plugging through in the summertime. I know that there are a couple of committees um, that would like to do that as well. So I, I think that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that I can go back and inform them that, that you have done that. Uh, just a couple questions. One, you're talking about focus groups with residents not currently engaged, and you gave a great example of mm -hmm. the Afghani and Somalian group. Are there others that you have identified, um, or how will you identify those other groups? Right now, we're trying to identify them possibly through the discussion, either online, in person, or on the phone with the neighborhood associations. Um, there's a lot of ethnic groups that we're in the process of, uh, the one subcommittee is reaching out. They're also looking at some of the unengaged groups. They were looking, uh, I'm not sure how they managed to deal with some people in the downtown core with some uh, multiple disabilities and stuff and issues and how the struggles that they had. Um, the LBG, Q uh, group, they're doing some reaching out there. So we're sort of, I'll be honest, sort of stumbling along. Like what we're finding is it just keeps growing and growing and growing. Like there's so many different groups and how you engage them all. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a volunteer group, we're uh, doing our best and reaching in many different places. So we've got quite a group on the committee. So I think that's the diversity of the committee gives us some strength and reaching out to the community. Yeah, that's great. Um, I, I like the um, idea that you're talking about initiating and organizing a, a joint meeting with committees from Waterloo and Cambridge. I think that's that's really uh, incredible way to, like you say, to understand some of the problems that mm -hmm. the other communities are having that we may have a similarity to. Um, my other question was uh, reviewing the grant process. So I, I, my question is, what kind of grants are you, have we p given out in the past? There is a budget for $10,000 and it's done some community events, my understanding. I'm new on the committee, so some community events. Um, we're not exactly sure. This is the thing here. One of our feelings is we just don't want to do $10,000. You just want to do 100 here, 200 there. It doesn't really have much of a, 
a bang for it. Um, where we're going to go with that, I think we got to look, sort of fix our terms of reference of the committee before we can start saying what we're going to fund. Um, if it gets, we're not advertising that we have money because as soon as you say you've got money, it's uh, people will line up to get it. So we want to try to have some, do something that could have an impact, possibly supporting the concept of the uh, mini World Cup for soccer in the spring. We're not exactly sure yet. Okay. So we're hoping, hoping by the new year we're going to have a better idea of what the committee is about. And I think it's sort of exciting. It's through uh, Juanita Metzger who sits on all three Safe and Healthies in Cambridge, Kitchener and Waterloo. She's with uh, Crime Prevention Council. So she was the one that initiated this uh, sort of joint, mm -hmm. what are we doing with Safe and Healthy in the three communities? And maybe if we can, more people working together uh, on a, with a common front will be uh, better for the community. Okay, thank you. If this um, hasn't, motion hasn't been moved, I, I, I'll move it. Okay. Those are all the, the questions, Mr. Uh, Kluski, um, but we have one comment from Councillor Davey. Thank you, uh, Chair Annettis. I Yeah, I just wanted to comment briefly that uh, you know this committee was up in the air not too long ago, and I'm ha really happy to see uh, the energy with uh, where the committee is now. I'm gonna, I want to comment just quickly on two items that I find particularly might be relevant to Council. Uh, and again, the, the Neighbourhood Association information gathering. Part of that as well is the idea that um, a safe community uh, comes by proxy of an engaged community or community that participates. Uh, so one of the, what we're looking at here essentially is uh, some neighborhood associations are very successful in what they do, uh, more so than others, and we're going to see if there's going to be some information sharing because um, these neighborhood, neighborhood associations are they're literally groups of people that come together, and sometimes to be effective you need to understand some business and marketing skills and that sort of thing to outreach to get those, those people that you're missing in. So that will be part of it. And just on the grant process, I'm not sure if it was completely clear, but we, haven't, we have not given out any grants, and they're essentially frozen until we review um, how to best use uh, that budget. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we will take a recess for, uh, yeah, communi for the Community and Infrastructure Service Committee agenda, and we will move into special caucus. Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry, I forgot all about that. All, all those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Um, okay. Okay. Go ahead, Councillor Ineski. Okay, thank you. I call this uh, special council meeting to order, and uh, I need a motion to uh, have us go into uh, in camera. Councillor Fernandez, seconded by Councillor Singh. All those in favor? Oh, uh, comment, Mr. Councillor Gazzola. I can't hear you. I have a question as to why the first item is being dealt with in caucus. We're really talking about a policy. We're not talking about any specific individuals. We're, we're talking about how should we do something. So why, why should we not give everyone the benefit of our discussions? So why is it being held in caucus? Mr. Chapman can address that. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I've seen uh, Jennifer Scher was the uh, uh, the originator of the report, but I don't that's see her here, so. That's correct. It is here so that Matt, so the council can receive legal advice on the issue, and I would suggest, Mr. Chair, that either uh, she can speak to it in a general sense here, or that can be the first question that's posed to her in caucus to explain why it's there, and if council does not support it, it can come back into open session. Is she coming down for the presentation? She's um, out in the lobby, but again, I think quite often council will deal with that question first and then decide in caucus whether or not they wish to continue in caucus or in open session. Okay, thank you. Does that answer your question, Councillor Gazzola? Yes. Okay. On that basis, any other questions? Okay, call a vote to proceed to... No, we're going to discuss this in caucus to see for the rationale. So, uh, all those in favor to go in caucus? Opposed? It's carried. So we were assessed into caucus and then uh, come back afterwards, which may take an hour, to complete the balance of the community infrastructure community services meeting.
Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chris Denick. Thank you. You may proceed. Oh, and Mr. Allen, you 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 want to prepare a statement beforehand? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and members of the Community Infrastructure Services Committee. Today's staff are pleased to present the results of the Cold Creek Environmental Assessment. Uh, we completed this study as a Schedule B environmental assessment under the MEA guidelines. The study was initiated in 2010, and the, uh, it was initiated to find uh, solutions to alleviate local flooding along the Cold Creek. Uh, as a separate component to this study, we are also looking at opportunities to retrofit a stormwater uh, pond within Forfar Park, which is at the upstream limits of the project. Uh, this study is being completed with the assistance of our consultant, Aquifer Beach, and at this time I'll just ask them to start their presentation and we'll get right into it. Go ahead, Mr. Nenick. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to present the results of the class environmental assessment for uh, Cold Creek. Um, I'd like to take you through the objectives as well as the project itself and take you through a tour of Cold Creek as it exists today. Uh, primary objectives for the study were to determine a preferred alternative to alleviate local flooding. Um, and it essentially extended from Matthew Street to the existing stormwater facility, which is in uh, Forfar Park. And it's uh, referred to as Pond 6. Uh, the study also evaluated that opportunity to look at that retrofit to provide additional water quality controls for Cold Creek itself. This is the study area here. Um, you can see Forfar Park in the bottom left corner, extending all the way to essentially to uh, just the Lackner Drive there. Um, We'll take you through a tour of the, of the creek. It's important to understand, I guess, some context of what Cold Creek looks like. This is the origins of Cold Creek within Forfar Park. Um, you can see the properties. There's a, the hedge on the, on the right side of the screen. Uh, very close proximity to existing structures and residential properties along, along that stretch. Um, this is looking back that upstream direction. Uh, you see that hedge as an indicator of where we're looking. Uh, it's a very narrow stretch of creek through this, through this section. It's groundwater fed. Um, it's a somewhat of a cold, cool water fisheries through that area. Um, again, looking further downstream, you can see the proximity to the, the local residents, uh, very narrow channel width. This is right upstream of the crossing at Rossay Avenue, and this is the crossing itself. Um, you can see the roadway of Rossay uh, in, the, in the background there. As we cross the street from Rossay, we now enter private property. Um, at this point, the creek is no longer on city-owned land. Uh, it's all within private property. Um, you can see it's, a, again, still a very narrow channel. Um, so we are now in that middle section to the north of Rossay, uh, but before Natchez. Um, this is looking from Victoria Road um, towards the creek, which is behind those trees along the back section. Um, this is uh, Victoria Road is on the right side of this, this, this street. We're looking uh, in a down, an upstream direction. Um, there were some existing works that have taken place previously uh, in that section. As you continue towards Natchez, again, the banks get a little bit steeper. It's a little bit more of an incised channel. And finally, we end up uh, here where Coal Creek now flows subsurface, and this is actually goes underneath an existing building. Um, so that culvert uh, is a, an older culvert, um, and it, this is actually where the capacity issue, uh, a lot of the flooding is, is, is originating from is, is some of these constrictions within the channel. And we're in this section right here just to give you a sense of, of where the channel now goes subsurface uh, private property. Uh, it reemerges uh, just upstream of Natchez uh, beneath the parking lot structure, as you can see there. Um, it then goes beneath uh, Natchez Road um, through private property again. Um, and this shot, I think, sums up the conditions on this side. Uh, a lot of encroachment, historic encroachment into the water course. There are some failing uh, infrastructure elements. Uh, wooden walls, rock walls, et cetera, that have been installed, uh, again, previous, uh, previous works. Um, some older infrastructure that are remnants of a past time within that area as well. And then the channel essentially becomes a con concrete line channel through this section, has a, a two 90 degree turns. Um, and this is the private property as well, flowing through uh, downstream of Natchez. And then we make a, a turn and we start running parallel to Rossay Road uh, here as well, just upstream of the pedestrian bridge, if people uh, know the area. Um, from this point, we have a linear channel that runs from here all the way to um, the end of the study area at Lackner. In this condition, in this particular area, there's a pedestrian walkway that connects to the bridge. Um, the channel here has very tall banks. Um, 
there's quite a lot of capacity here for flood flows. So it's the upstream area from this that is causing some of the flooding issues within Cole Creek. And you can see that the, the width of that channel um, compared to upstream as quite a large section. And this is looking uh, at the channel condition. Very little erosion within this section. Um, within most of Cold Creek, it's a very stable water course, um, for the exception, of course, of the flooding. Um, but from a bank stability and the uh, bedrock itself, or the ground condition, uh, excuse me, not bedrock, uh, it is very stable, and we don't see a lot of erosion within that area. Um, this is the existing flood risk map. So this is the 100-year event flood lines um, should it pass through that system currently in its current state. Um, the red line is the outer limits of the flood floodplain. Um, you can see numerous structures as well as uh, several roadways are uh, within the flood line of the 100 year in the current condition. So this was the, the reason the study was started and this is kind of the existing conditions. Uh, looking at alternatives, of course we started with a do nothing alternative, uh, leaving the creek in its current condition as required by the EA process. Uh, option number two, quite simply, is an overflow sewer. The channel would remain in its current state but existing capacity or um, capacity that is needed would be diverted along Rosse uh, back into the channel in the large events. Uh, alternative number three is to look at increasing the stream capacity itself within the constriction. Um, this would include essentially enlarging that channel by eight times the width um, to 20, uh, just under 20, uh, 21 meters wide. Uh, alternative four is to look at options of actually rerouting the entire channel itself. Uh, to a more appropriate alignment and to provide additional capacity. In this case, one alternative was to look at a straight alignment with the existing channel. Uh, secondary option was to um, look at different opportunities on how we could reroute the channel for capacity issues around the constriction. Uh, you'll notice in each one of these options there are buildings and or properties that are identified for um, either would need to be demolished or uh, purchased by the city and those were evaluated as well. Um, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And finally, alternative six is to reroute the entire stream and remove the existing, uh, essentially fill in the existing channel as it exists. As part of the EA process, in this uh, particular study, we did a two-phase evaluation. The first phase evaluation was a, a feasibility screening uh, used to evaluate pros and cons, identify alternatives to be carried forward. Essentially, we were looking to eliminate options that were not feasible from a technical perspective, an approvals perspective, from a community perspective. Um, from that, we did a secondary detailed evaluation using 23 criteria under the headings of physical and natural environment, social, cultural, economic, and then of course technical and engineering. The feasibility screening looked at the ability to meet the study objectives for flood reduction, uh, technical and physical feasibility, obviously estimated cost, landowner acceptance because of those properties that were identified in structures, municipal and agency acceptance, environmental impacts, and social impacts. The six alternatives were evaluated under that, that strategy. Uh, alternatives one, two, four, and five were carried forward, with the remaining two were not carried forward for various reasons. Um, to go into a little more detail, alternative three uh, had a high degree of risk and a lack of, of physical feasibility. And alternative number six was not carried forward due to a lack of agency support and feasibility. So we carried four to detailed design. As an example of the 23 criteria that we looked at for these options, uh, each with equal weighting, um, broken into the four main categories. The preferred alternative for Cold Creek to alleviate the flooding was an alternative number two, overflow sewer. Uh, property owners, as part of the public consultation process, two PICs were held. In addition, separate landowner consultations were undertaken by the consulting team and the municipality. Um, we approached them to determine their um, whether or not they would support further discussions on the acquisition of their properties to support some of those options. And the rankings or the current preferred solution reflects their, their opinion on whether or not they'd be willing to enter into further discussions with the city on some of those options. So under the preferred alternative, alternative number two, the channel would remain in its current state. Low flows or the flows below the one and five year would continue through the channel, preserving the habitat and the fisheries that are there. Under the very large events, um, the larger flows would be diverted along this, this overflow sewer down Rossay uh, Road back into the channel downstream of the pedestrian bridge. Um, and approximately 6.6 .6 cubic meters uh, per second would go through the existing channel. The remainder would go through the overflow channel itself. 
So again, from a primary objective standpoint, looking for flooding issues, resolving flooding issues that currently exist. Um, this is the future proposed flood risk map. It looks at, at the implementation of the preferred solution number two. The yellow line would be the our proposed flood line, uh, the ultimate condition when this is implemented, versus the red. And what you can see, if, may, if I may summarize, obviously the flood lines are much narrower through that section. We've reduced them. Um, 20 structures have been removed entirely from the 100-year flood plain under the proposed conditions. We also have reduced the extent or the top width of the flood line uh, anywhere from 46 to 114 meters. Uh, we've also reduced the water surface elevation by 0.6 to 0.9 meters at key locations. And we've removed flooding on Carson Drive and Victoria uh, Street North. And we've reduced significantly the flooding along Rossay Avenue in the 100-year event. So just a, a quick summary of some of the, I guess, positive uh, results of the preferred solution. Uh, the addition of Forfar Park, um, there was a previous study done, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, that looked at Forfar Park and Pond 6. We were looking at an opportunity as part of this study to improve water quality within Cold Creek as well, as, as well as looking at the flooding. So there was an opportunity identified within that existing stormwater facility. This is the park itself. Uh, you can see the stormwater facility is a, the triangular element on the left of the park um, adjacent to the, the, uh, the roadway. Um, in 2010, uh, there's a, a Class EA uh, undertaken by Ackford Beach in the city uh, to look at options to retrofit these existing ponds within a municipal A-plus process, uh, which limited the expansion of the facility. Um, the facility had to remain within the existing footprint. As part of that recommended strategy, uh, Pond 6 was recommended to be undertaken under a secondary Class EA process, Schedule B, which would allow for the expansion. Uh, this was the original Class EA document. You can see Pond 6, and that triangular element. And at the time, it was identified that the city-owned lands to the right uh, were available for a future expansion, but that Class EA scope did not permit it. As such, it was included within uh, this Class EA Schedule B, uh, being at the right of the upstream uh, area of the study limits. Um, so we looked at four options. We looked at a do-nothing alternative, the inclusion of a wet pond for water quality, a wet land for water quality, or a hybrid facility. Um, some of the pictures you'll see there, um, you'll see two uh, ponds that were retrofitted within the city of Kitchener recently, um, Pond 4 and Pond 22. An example of a wetland retrofit is also there in the center, which is uh, in the Lake Simcoe watershed. And these are all to improve water quality. In this case, it was a detailed evaluation of 18 criteria uh, under the same four categories. Very similar criteria, but focusing on water quality instead of flooding. Primarily, uh, after the evaluation, the preferred alternative was the inclusion of a wetland. Uh, which would provide the 100% of the water quality requirement per the Ministry of the Environment, um, would expand within the existing area of land that the city currently owns, um, would also improve the aesthetics of the park through the inclusion of, of vegetation uh, features, a lookout, um, but as well would remove a significant population of invasive species within the Pond 6 right now, which is buckthorn, uh, is almost 100% of the population. So there's a, an added benefit there as well. Uh, next steps, we're looking to file a notice completion on November 6th and implementation is subject uh, to the budget. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, several questions from from committee and can you please be succinct as possible? Councillor Singh. Yes, thank you and uh, I'll try to uh, shorten my questions as much as possible. So you mentioned some of the other alternatives. One, a very good document, very well in depth study, so that's good. Uh, found it very helpful for the the need for this uh, this to be done. Um, so the other, other alternatives, uh, the report outlines what the cost would be for alternative two, I believe. Right? Were the costs? Do you have them for the other alternatives that you mentioned? Other the, than do nothing, of course. Yeah. In the preliminary screening, we looked at uh, preliminary cost estimates. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> they range from obviously less than a million dollars um, for the do nothing alternative, and they range anywhere from three to five. Uh, option five was two to five million, uh, and then the three and six were greater than five point five million dollars or five million dollars. So alternative two was one of the lowest options, other than do nothing, of course. Yeah, it, it, it was comparable to other options, but it, it did have a lower price point. Uh, but again, I will, I guess, stress that uh, cost is only one of the twenty-three elements that of were, course, were given. Of course. Um, 
credence in, in the No, in the I, I understand a. that, mm -hmm. and, uh, but we have to be cognizant of it Absolutely. at the same time. Um, this may be a question of our finance staff. Uh, the report said that it was in our capital forecast, the expenditure for this project. So was that prior to when we had initiated the stormwater utility or after? It was added to after. Through you, Mr. Chair, I believe it was put in after uh, the stormwater utility was set up. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Councillor Gazzola. Yeah, most of mine have been answered. Uh, very good. Very good pictures. Great pictures. Uh, the the preferred alternative is the best according to the criteria that has been established. Right. That's so, correct. So. Um, we really, we really have no options here. We have to, you, you picked it according to the best criteria, and so we have to move forward, right? That's correct, yeah. yeah. So we're just here rubber stamping, which is fine. Uh, the other question, uh, and I was wondering about cost, uh, but it wasn't a major criteria. You said all the criteria were ranked equally, or? Yes, they were. Uh, 23 criteria ranked equally under the four main categories including obviously the social aspects, economic, uh, the environment as well. Uh, we're all ranked in the same so, criteria. Who, who decides, the, did this council get an, an opportunity to approve the criteria? Do we get an opportunity to do that? Because that's the only kick we really have at the cap. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, no, we did not bring the criteria to council. These are uh, typical criteria that we use to evaluate these EAs. Um, we sometimes do weightings with different criteria, but in this case, we chose to, to weight everything equally. So was there a member of council on the, on the project team? Through you, Mr. Chair, there was not anyone on the project team from council. Okay, I, I was of the understanding that, uh, that council did get a, an opportunity to approve the criteria and then once the criteria is established, if you go move accordingly, you know, there's no further need to uh, approve anything. So that, that's fine. Uh, I, I, that's for another, another day. Um, what, what is the cost? Did I see the total cost for this project is about two and a half million? That is correct. And, and it, it is in the budget now? Through you, Mr. Chair, yeah, we do have uh, an item in the budget for Cold Creek in 2015 that's about two and a half million dollars. And it's in the stormwater management budget? Correct. Yeah, okay, thank you. Councillor Fernandez. Uh, thank you, um, a couple of questions and then, uh, should we do comments at the same time in the interest of time? Sure. Okay, um, so how often has uh, Cold Creek been, uh, and that area been subject to flooding? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, from our background research and talking, talking to some of the residents, there was some previous flooding uh, within the last 10 years, uh, fairly minor to some of the buildings uh, upstream of the constriction uh, bordering Victoria Road. Um, to my knowledge, we haven't had severe flooding within that area uh, based on our background review. We have, sorry, we have or we have not had any? We have not, not to the 100-year. Okay. I, I guess that that would... Th that begs the question, then why are we um, moving forward if, if, it, if the flooding is an issue? And, the, and the, is that the rationale that we started doing this um, EA and, and looking at changing the channel of this creek? Through you, Mr. Chair, it's, it's a risk, uh, it's a flood risk map, as you can see. Um, the odds of that event coming through are one in 100 at any given rainstorm. So it's a, it's a question of managing the risk to the residents and the structures within the floodplain. Uh, current policies would prohibit the construction of, of any uh, structure within the 100-year flood lane or the regional, whichever is larger, by the Grand River Conservation Authority. Given that this is existing, uh, we're looking to alleviate that flooding to the, the, the greatest degree possible. Okay, so can you go, go back to a couple of pictures? Um, the, probably about five or six. I'll let you know. Oh. Uh, there, oop, uh, that, yeah, that one and that one. Is this encroachment, um, I mean, one of them is literally right over top of the creek. So what are we going to be doing about these encroachment issues? 
Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, these would remain. Uh, this is private property as it stands at the moment. The channel would, and the preferred option would remain as is in its current state, uh, and the overflow would just direct flows around the constriction. Okay, and then the other, the one just uh, before this, that's also private property? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so some of the questions that um, I understand the Environmental Committee had asked was, have you um, spoken to these private property owners about um, working with REAP and the RAIN program so that any flooding that does occur on, the, on these properties w would be mitigated to the best possible um, way? Through you, Mr. Chair, um, that, that question did come up, and, and what we're going to do is take that back to the stormwater utility. Um, perhaps it's, it's a public information uh, exercise that needs to be taken place to avoid some of these encroachments on private property uh, or where the stream goes through private property. Um, it's treated more from a stewardship point of view. Um, and we'll take that back to the stormwater group and have them uh, address it. Okay, I, and I think that that's a good uh, first step, but I think we probably need to address that um, uh, the ability for these these owners to to mitigate. I mean, if the, it doesn't sound like we're, we've had a lot of problems with floods in this area. I mean, if they're minor, um, but we have seen a significant change in our weather patterns in the last number of certainly in the last six months. Um, I think that I would really like to see that this becomes more than a stewardship, that, but actually that when we're working, will we be working in the stream through this private property? Have we been given uh, approvals to do that? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, no, no, no works on private property or within the existing channel with the exception of the crossing at uh, Rosse um, or at the outlet point, which is uh, in the area of the pedestrian bridge, would be proposed. Okay. I, I, I realize that we can't... Um, affect some change on private property, but I think it, you know, if we really, we really need to seriously encourage people not to uh, encroach like this. Um, so one of the questions that also was asked at the Environmental Co Committee was uh, how important was the fact that the minimal land acquisition of land were required play into the decision of which option we chose? So what was that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, please? How important was the fact that minimal land acquisitions of land were required to play into the decision or what the option that we chose? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the decision was made very early on as part of the project to do landowner consultation uh, for the properties that were subject to potential purchase or structures that would need to be removed. Um, the weighting of landowner acceptance is obviously impacted by their ability or their willingness to cooperate with the city. Uh, there are other criteria that are affected as well, which is integration with existing infrastructure, uh, et cetera, that are very closely linked to whether or not we could get local landowners to cooperate with the city on those preferred options. Um, we did have a varying degree of support from those landowners, ranging from very supportive to not supportive at all. Okay. So they are uh, in within the criteria as well. Okay. You had showed a picture of some old salt fencing and old structures. Um, now, of course, was that on private or was that on, on, our, on the lands that we're going to be working on? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, that was private property. Um, that was, has been dealt with uh, through a separate process with the Grand River Conservation Authority, um, who has dealt with that, that particular landowner as a separate process. Uh, Grand River Conservation was involved in this project uh, from the project onset. Oh, great. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, so, uh, two quick comments. Uh, well, maybe three, actually. I apologize. Uh, just on the community engagement, I I'm looking at the, the timing you chose. July 12th, I mean, probably, first maybe I should ask the question, how many people attended that public meeting in July? Uh, in July, I believe it was uh, 10 or 11 people that attended. Okay. Do you know, do you have the numbers for the February one? I do. If you'll bear with me for a moment, please. Um, we had 10 residents for PIC number one, and then we also had... Um, 
12 for PIC number two, and then in addition to private consultations as well. Okay, all right, so you had roughly the same then. Okay. Um, as I, you know, I really do have some concerns about doing a public uh, information session in, in July, especially right in, in tandem with uh, what would have been the, the long weekend in July. So that's one of my comments. Um, the other one is, uh, sorry, that, that we did not, we have not seen the minutes from the Kitchener Environmental Advisory Committee um, yet. And I, I'm a little bit concerned that we are making a decision without our advisory commi committee's comments. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why I'm a little bit reluctant. I would rather see, I would really prefer to have the decision um, made next week at council when we are, have the ability to read what the comments from the Kitchener Advisory Committee are. That's what their, uh, their job is, is to advise us. So um, that I, may, I may ask for deferral in a, in a moment. And um, Councillor Gazzola made a very good point. I, my understanding, and I, I apologize, this is really your question, it's more of a question to staff. Uh, we had gone through a process that my understanding was that any EAs, future EAs, were to include the ward councillor or a counselor, an opportunity for council to be a part of the terms of reference. So what happened to that? Through Go ahead, Ms. Robinson. Thank you. Through you, Mr. Chair. The uh, staff report I brought to committee on March 18, 2013, proposed uh, new protocols for EAs at the City of Kitchener. We intended to implement that following budget 2014 because a number of the EAs in the 2013 cycle had already initiated. Further, um, as you recall, uh, we, we we're going to identify EAs as routine, complex, and very complex. Routine EAs, which this would have been classified as with staff's uh, agreement, um, we, we would do them the same way we're doing them now. A ward councillor would be consulted around public meetings, but a ward councillor wouldn't sit on a steering committee. So this, you, there wouldn't have been council involvement in the CA per the proposed protocols that we're implementing in 2014. Okay, uh, I can appreciate that. I, I, I guess I look at this as a bit more complex because of the fact it's going through pro private and public lands, uh, and I think there's, there's um, some implications. Uh, nevertheless, I, I looked to the, co the ward councillor and he said that he had been involved. So um, then I guess my, only, my own, only suggestion would be that we defer a decision of this until uh, next week council, just because I think it's important for the rest of us to read the minutes of the uh, Environmental Advisory Committee and, and what was uh, questioned and asked of that. So I'm gonna put that forward as a, an amendment. For timing? Yeah, hold yeah, on I can, until we I have can the rest hold of that the Yep, I can hold that. Okay. Councillor Yanesky. Uh, thank you. Uh, just a few questions. On page 710, there is a map that you've, uh, an air photo that you showed of a cul-de-sac and the location of Pond 6. I, I looked at the previous maps that you had on uh, two or three pages before. I'm trying to find where that pond is located because I, I couldn't read and find it. So help me out. What's, what is that? What, is that a cul-de-sac or is that a curve in a road on the left-hand side of that page? It is a cul-de-sac. What cul street is it? Three, Mr. Chair. Uh, it is a cul-de-sac. Um, it is at Four Far Park, Manchester Road. Thank you. Manchester Road. That's Manchester Road. Okay. And you said it's a cul-de-sac. Yes, it is. And it's called a road. Through you, Mr. Chair, it's, it's the end of Manchester Road, which ends at a cul-de-sac. It might be called Manchester Court. I don't have that information okay. in front of me, but it, it is Manchester okay. Road. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, you talk about alternative two as being the preferred one, and you talk about the overflow. Is this an overland or an underground flow through Rock, along Rockway? Through you, Mr. Chair, it is a, it is a subsurface overflow beneath the, the roadway. Beneath the roadway. Beneath the roadway. Okay, because you're talking it's an overflow, but I just didn't know where it's above or below. Overflow the of the channel through the under under subsurface uh, channel or piping uh, back into the creek. So okay. we're diverting flows above the threshold of flooding. Um, further downstream, east of Matthew Street, which you say is all private property, or a good chunk of it is, um, is there no concern about flows further east from there? Is that all cable being handled from your analysis? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. East of Matthew is, is city property. Uh, actually, the uh, Natchez uh, area, basically from Natchez to the pedestrian bridge, 
uh, is private property, and then at the, at the pedestrian bridge, which is just upstream of, of Matthew, uh, it is, uh, or at Matthew, excuse me, it is a city property. Uh, okay. The analysis did extend all the way to Lackner. Uh, there is sufficient capacity within that channel. It is much wider and much deeper within that channel all the way to Lackner, and it can accommodate the 100-year flood event. Okay, that answers that question. Um, you're talking about not, not much flooding, but there was a big storm flood that we had back in 1974. I don't know if you can remember back that far. Uh, and of course, the Grand River flooded and all that stuff, and a whole bunch of creeks as well. I'm just going to ask to what extent, if you know, was the flooding in this area back 40 years ago? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, studies at Coal Creek uh, began in 1976. Um, okay. There has been reports of flooding that go back uh, a very long time. Uh, this was originally constructed as an agricultural drain as we built up around it. Um, the, the occurrence of flooding increased. Um, major damages or losses were not reported in any of those reports, but uh, the fact that studies, hydraulic studies, were undertaken in the 1970s suggest that uh, capacity issues were an issue, and those reports do identify constrictions within the channel at that stage as well. Okay, and so you said in '76 those studies took more uh, um, a follow-up on that because those lines actually did come into Kitchener in '73 through annexation. So I guess there'll be limited information there. Uh, the blockage. What, ha what happens if there's a property owner that I mean, he's got those properties and buildings overhanging the creek almost. Um, what happens if a property owner blocks the creek purposely with fill? What do you guys do then? Through you, Mr. Chair, uh, any fill placement within the 100-year flood line would contravene current GRCA policies. Uh, any diversion of the creek, um, any placement of fill, any obstruction of flow uh, would be handled through, largely through the Grand River Conservation Authority. So they take care of the issue? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor Davey. Thank you. I actually don't have any questions of the project. I had them all answered at the public information sessions. My only question is um, the motion of the deferral has been brought forward. I just wanted to clarify that this is this project is going to be happening for quite a while, so there would be no concerns in terms of timing if this were to def be deferred until council. Through to the chair, uh, no, there wouldn't be any major concerns. It's just, as uh, Mr. Denick pointed out, it's a, it's a risk that um, we have for flooding, but another year... Um, there's no urgency, I would no, say. Okay, but in terms of in terms of ratifying a council, that's fine. Then. Uh, sure, so I guess I will um, move that when appropriate, Mr. Chair, and I'll just comment. You, you, can, you can move it okay. right now. Okay, I'll just comment briefly as well. I, I, I'll support the deferral, but I mean, realistically, going forward, I think if the Environmental Committee did have any major issue with this, they could have, um, of course, passed resolution. But I just want to get that out there. Okay. Councillor Fernandez, you want to... Thank you. Just, uh, yeah, I just, uh, they weren't asked for a recommendation. So unfortunately, if they're not asked for a recommendation, then they often don't uh, move forward one. And that's, and that's one of the reasons I would like to hear um, what the minutes reflect uh, of that meeting. So just a deferral till next week so that we're able to review the minutes of that meeting before uh, we ratify this. I'm not saying that I don't support it. I just really want to hear what, what they said at that meeting. Can we get them? Will we get the minutes before next next week, Monday? I'll advise yes or no. Okay, super. Thank you, Colin. All right, then. We have So the last two items, number eight, and, and we're going to be adding that on to the information as long, along with the other information that's detailed on, in the information section. So if you have any questions by committee, please answer those to staff through, through email. Okay. And that, that concludes the Community Infrastructure Service Committee, and I'll hand over to Councillor Yaneski for the special council meeting.